Hello, so today you find me in the Cessna 152 at Wickham Air Park in Microsoft Flight Simulator. And it's really the beginning of a journey for me because if you've been following the channel recently, you will see I received a parcel in the post yesterday containing the fixed wing pilot starter kit from Pooley's flight equipment on the internet, pooleys.com. This is the pack of educational materials that a student pilot would typically use to train or educate themselves towards a, a private pilot's license. So I'm going to be using it in combination with Flight Simulator to establish the correct procedures for doing things to operate an aircraft properly. And I'm going to be referring to the guidebooks along the way and following, you know, their, their contents and seeing, you know, how closely we can follow the real training in terms of the simulator. So we're going to be looking at basic airmanship today, so the, the various checks we do before a flight, then getting into the air, flying an aeroplane and operating it, and then doing a little bit of a circuit perhaps and coming into land. So let's go and jump into the simulator and go inside the aircraft and have a little look around the cockpit first so familiarize ourselves with the 152. So first of all down on the on the floor of the aircraft you have the fuel shutoff valve which allows the fuel from the wing tanks the fuel is held in the wings of a 152 allows the fuel to the engine so that's the master shutoff valve. So if we remove the yoke out of the way which is kind of a nice trick in flight simulator we can see around the cockpit easily. So let's just have a little look around all of the instruments and explain them. So we've got indicated airspeed at the top left. So airspeed is measured in a light aircraft by a pitot tube, this tube that's underneath the, the port or left wing. And it measures air pressure hitting the, the front of that tube. And then that is converted by this instrument into the speed you are traveling through the air not over the ground so depending on wind or um, air pressure that might be different so it's worth bearing that in mind okay so uh, next to it you've got the attitude indicator or as some people call it an artificial horizon so you can see there's a little marker on it saying gyro so which gives away that it is driven by a gyro behind the panel and that gives also a way there is a suction um, gauge here. So the attitude indicator and the compass are both driven by a gyro and or both, both driven by gyros and they both require a, a suction pump to be operating on the engine that will provide the air pressure for them to operate correctly. So if that were to fail, then they obviously will fail. So that's why you have that gauge there. Then there's a clock in the middle always handy to have. There's an altimeter here so that measures your height above sea level in feet. The short needle is thousands of feet, the long needle is hundreds of feet. You will see there are two small windows inside it, they're called Coleman windows. The guy that invented the, the common format you see altimeters in was called Coleman. And they give you the um, the calibration numbers for the air pressure, the barometric pressure of the air temp or the air around you. So you can see as you change the calibration of the barometric, barometric pressure, the needles move because the, the instrument works by measuring air pressure again. So obviously air pressure varies from day to day with the, the weather. So on the right hand side you've got the barometric pressure in inches mercury which is used typically in the US. On the left hand side you've got the air pressure measured in hectopascals or millibars which is used in much of the rest of the world. So next to that you've got the navigation instruments, the NAV1, NAV2 instruments. We're not going to get into that today of how they work. They'll be on a later session. Underneath that you've got the vertical speed in hundreds of feet per minute. So if you're going up at five you're climbing at 500 feet a minute. If you're going down at five you're descending at 500 feet a minute. Across from there you've got a compass, a gyro driven compass. And then further across from there you've got the turn coordinator. So this shows you the longitudinal attitude of the aircraft, so its bank angle. So that you notice there are some markers on the outside of it. So when the aircraft is in motion in flight, if it is banked at a given angle, you can 
you can presume it will be turning at a two minute turn rate okay so you do an entire circle in two minutes uh, underneath that you've got a slip angle indicator so there's a floating ball inside here if the air, if the tail is not following the fuselage through the air this ball will slide to one side or the other so it will indicate that the aircraft is actually crabbing along through the air okay so during a turn if you don't use the rudder during a turn the the ball will swing to one side or the other indicating the airplane is skidding sideways instead of actually the tail following the nose if that makes sense okay so coming down we've got the parking brake so if we go and operate the parking brake if we release it you'll see the the pedals move on the ground so you tip the rudder pedals to engage the wheel brakes which are on the left and right rear wheels of the aircraft so obviously with the plunger pulled out you have locked the brakes on You've got engine primer so we can prime the engine it's pulling fuel through the tubes to the engine you then got um, the battery master switch the alternator switch you've got magnetos and start switch so most aircraft of this era don't have spark plugs so they have magnetos which when provided power generate the spark to ignite the fuel and then you obviously got a starter a starter motor so when you turn the key past right magneto left magneto both magnetos when you get to start it engages the starter motor which spins the propeller obviously that in concert with the spark and the fuel is going to start the engine you got the brightness here for the instrument lights then you've got dome lighting which is the light overhead in the cockpit you've got pitot heat which warms up the pitot tube outside to prevent icing from forming or ice forming you've got the it's worth pointing out you shouldn't use that all the time on the ground you should only do it when you're going to the runway because if it's on for too long it will overheat the pitot tube and damage it you've got the or damage the heating element i should say the uh, nav lights so that's the lights on the end of the wings the strobe light is the red the red light on top of the tail the beacon light is the really bright light underneath the aircraft you've got taxi lights and landing lights which point forwards obviously to show you where you're going okay so you have a trim um wheel here so that is elevator trim which will trim the aircraft we'll see that while we're flying along we'll be operating the trim the entire time to make sure the airplane is flying in a stable manner You've got carburetor heat so the carburetor sucks if you don't know how engines work carburetor sucks fuel into the engine uses a vacuum to do so one of the unfortunate physical side effects of a car or sorry of a vacuum is the carburetor kind of turns itself into the same or it makes itself work in the same way that a refrigerator does so when you have a vacuum conditional on the atmospheric conditions at the time the carburetor can get cold enough to cause ice to form even on a warm sunny day it can do it so carburetor heating um, stops that ice from forming okay so then we have the throttle so to increase the throttle we push it forwards to retard the throttle we pull it back then we have the mixture control for the engine so to provide a rich mixture so to make the engine produce the most power at sea level you have a rich mixture as you climb and as the aircraft gets you know into a more um into a, a more cruise situation uh, it's, this is, i'm finding it difficult to find the words but you would lean the engine out yeah which would mean that you're not providing as much fuel to the engine the reason for having this as well is if you think about it you can control the amount of fuel going to the engine you can't control the amount of air coming into the engine and you need fuel and air to burn to to run the engine so as you climb into the atmosphere into the higher altitudes the air gets thinner so you need more air for the given amount of fuel and like i said you can't control the amount of air coming in but you can control the fuel so as you need more air to the to the amount of fuel you restrict the fuel so you lean the engine out by pulling this backwards obviously if you pull it all the way you shut the fuel off entirely and the engine comes to a stop so while you're flying as you see the rpm drop as you climb you lean the engine out so again We'll cover this in much more detail when we're flying around in later sessions. 
So you've got the flap lever there. So the flaps are towards the rear of the wing and they we won't see it until we're actually up. When we go out to the runway, we'll see them. Uh, I'll drop the flaps so you can actually generate more lift. And we're, we're going to go and have a walk around the airplane in a minute anyway. So then you've got cabin heating and you've got underneath here a whole raft of breakers, which are not simulated in this version of the Cessna 152. But they're kind of you think of them like fuses. So when you um, if you've got a surge in any part of the avionics or the systems around the aircraft, the breaker might pop out and disable it from you know prevent it from damaging the rest of the aircraft okay so let's go and have a walk around outside so we're going to press the insert key on the keyboard which is going to let us do this and i'm going to use an xbox controller to wander around and have a look so the typical ground checks you would do on an airplane you're going to kick the tire to make sure you've got good pressure in the tire you're going to be looking at the control surfaces on the way around so you've got the flap here that we talked about you would make, just make sure it's snug. You would go and give the control surfaces a wiggle. So you've got the, the ailerons here on the wing. And then you would carry on around. Make sure that the static strips are in good condition on the edge of the wing. And then you would make sure the lights are in good condition. You would come along the wing. You'd be looking at rivets along the way. Make sure none have popped if the aircraft's been stressed at all in the past. You make sure the various holes in the wing. This is for the um, stall. Uh, oh, what's the word? When, when you stall in a, a small aircraft, you hear a noise. It's typically generated by a what looks like a musical instrument that's set into the wing. So when the air hits the wing at a high enough angle of attack, it plays the instrument and makes the noise. So then you've got the, the pitot tube. And then if we dip down underneath the wing, you'll see there are some access panels. Actually, before we do that, let's look on top. So you've got the radio antennas there and you've got the fuel filler cap. So if we dip down underneath the wing, you've got these access panels that aren't really modeled that wonderfully in the sim. But in the real aircraft, you would pop those off if the aircraft's just come out of storage. And you would go around the aircraft with what looks like a sport drink bottle, but it's a bit more clever and you siphon off some fuel from underneath the wing tanks into that bottle looking for water in the fuel it's so obviously water and fuel don't mix so it's dead easy to see the water the reason for that is while the aircraft is um on the stand it could generate um or could form condensation inside the fuel tanks so you want to check that there's no water in there and just siphon it off if it is again you come around to the rest of the aircraft so you're going to kick that front tire see it's got good pressure you're going to open these access hatches to the the engine and again you're going to be looking for um, siphoning off fuel from the tubes that lead the fuel to the engine making sure there's no water in them and checking the various elements of the engine we're not going to go into too much detail with that today again you come around and check the condition of the spinner and the propeller and you're going to look in and there's a belt drive between the engine block typically and the spinner there is on this aircraft and you would check that and make sure the belt is in good condition and not chafing on anything make sure no animals have set up home in the um, engine cowl again you're going to check the um, the cylinder on the front suspension make sure it's not leaking you're going to look at all the linkages make sure everything's in good good order and again there's another access panel for this side of the engine above and you would be looking in and making the checks there and again, in the same way that we check the uh, the left wing, we're going to check the right wing. So you'd pop over the pa open the panels, check the fuel, look at the lights, come around. You would wiggle the control surfaces. I'm kind of skipping some of this so we don't see things you've already seen. And then check the fuselage and the horizontal stabilizer here. And again, you'd give the the surfaces a move with your hands to make sure all the linkages are in good order. And again, same is true with the, the rudder. So we just move over here and we can give the rudder a wiggle and make sure all the linkages and everything are good. And then eventually you make your way back to the cockpit and we would be ready to go flying. So we're going to press insert to go back inside the aeroplane and we'll put some of the controls back in place. So to get the aircraft running, what do we need to do? First things first, we did the fuel shutoff valve earlier. So we're going to move the mixture to rich. We are going to go and turn on the 
master battery switch so you can see the nav lights have come on the fuel quantity has moved to reflect the fuel that's in the tanks and you will see um, the the nav radios and com radios are switched on and you can also see the ADF is on and we are drawing from the battery is the needle has moved slightly to the left on the amp meter over there okay so we need to get the engine up and running so we're going to go and turn the or oh, sorry we're going to crack the throttle open slightly first and then we're going to turn the starter past both both magnetos to start hold it on for a second you can hear the engine kick there if you look at the rpm it's sitting at about a thousand rpm which is perfect oh we didn't put the beacon light on again this is just talking and trying to do too many things at once and not following a paper checklist in front of me before we started the engine we should have had the beacon light on okay so that's a huge mistake right there so you can verify the beacon light is on by looking on top of the tail you'll see that blinking away some pilots will also turn the nav lights on as well just for a bit of extra warning for the ground crew typically it's usually on commercial aircraft they'll put nav lights on first actually just to let people around the aircraft know that the crew are on board obviously in a smaller aircraft you can see people inside it okay so the airplane is ticking over and you're looking for the oil temperature coming up and the oil pressure which is obviously very low at the moment so just to confirm that the oil pressure is going to increase you would typically increase the revs to 1500 so you can see the needle coming up over here and you can see the oil pressure is responding which is good so then we can drop it back to a thousand revs okay so you turn the alternator on and you should find now that we are generating electricity over on the ammeter and we are good so let's get ready to fly it shall we so we got the beacon and the nav lights on and we put the taxi lights on to taxi and we'll put the yoke back on for the moment we'll come back to it in a moment i'll explain we are going to release the parking brake and slowly increase the throttle and we are rolling so you only need to taxi about walking pace there's no hurry so we're going out towards runway 24 at Booker Airfield so if we have a quick look at the map while we taxi actually I'll, I'll wait until we stop at the the runway before we look at the uh, the map to explain what we're going to do Okay, so I'm taking no notice you'll you'll notice of the, um, the holding points for the runway we've got no ATC today this is all just about showing you more than doing the procedural stuff with the, that you might do with the controller so we're going to sit on the parking brake here for a moment I just want to show you that on the map what we're going to do so we're going to fly out from runway 24 at Wickham Air Park we're going to fly out towards this area to the west of the airfield yeah, so we're going to follow what would be a normal climb out on runway 24 and exit straight on. Yeah, and go out to this area that I've marked on the map. And then once we've finished doing some manoeuvres and explaining things along the way and practicing things, we will go and join the circuit and come in and fly the circuit at Wickham Air Park. Okay, so you can see someone's just flown in in front of us. It's quite fortuitous. That's quite a nice landing they've just done. So we are going to move our flaps to take off position. Here comes somebody else. Have I just wandered into a group flight by any chance? Uh, I can't see. They're not using transmitter, so they're just people having some fun, I think. I've got live traffic on, so. Okay, so we go and turn on the landing lights now. We turn on the strobe light. We turn on the pitot heat. Uh, we can put our yoke back in place. And we're pretty much ready to go. So flaps are at takeoff position we release the parking brake we advance the throttle and we're off to the races we are probably going to go straight through them if they're going to taxi back along the runway we're going to take no notice of them we will rotate at 50 knots we're using the nose wheel steering on the rudder to hold the center line again on a later session we'll explain that and why that happens so there's 50 knots 
we rotate and we're in the air. So we've avoided them for today. So now we're monitoring airspeed. So we look at the direction we're going, 240, or 245 degrees I think it is, is the runway, actual runway direction. So if we're climbing too steeply, we drop the nose slightly. So we're on full power and a fully rich mixture and we're just climbing out, maintaining direction and speed. And we're using pitch to control speed. So we're just coming up to 1,000 feet, which is 500 feet above ground level at the airfield. But remember, the um, a typical... Well, we're getting a bit slow, so I'm just dropping the nose. A typical circuit would happen at 1,000 feet above airfield level, or AAL. Above airfield elevation, I think the full term is. So that would be 1,500 feet on our altimeter for the circuit. We're going to climb out to 500 feet above that, so we're going to climb to 2,000 feet for the things we're going to do today. So we're going to carry on on this direction, and we will cheat a little bit and look at the map to make sure we're off to the area where we want it to be to do some basic airmanship um, exercises. We're still climbing, still holding just under 60 knots, just dropping the nose gently. When we get to 2,000 feet, we will retract the flaps and pull the mixture back and pull the throttle back. We shouldn't run the throttle more than 75% in the cruise in the 152, according to the pilot operating handbook, so we will try to abide by that. So we're just coming up to 2,000 feet, so Flaps can come off. We're watching the vertical speed here in combination with the altitude. You'll see the speed gently increase. We're also going to trim. I'll, I'll explain all of this in a moment. Okay, so uh, we've got a positive vertical speed at the moment, so we're just correcting that with a little bit of trim. Okay, so we're flying along, and we should find on the map got our marker there yeah we've been blown a little bit by the wind and by not quite following the runway direction but we're gonna head around the back of Luxter Farm airstrip here into this area where we're going to fly over the top of Turville and Stoner where it's like a nice area of fields with nothing below us where we're not gonna disturb people too much so we're just gently climbing here we don't want to do that and also we don't want to go in the cloud this is for um, visual flight rules, so that would be bad. So I'm just descending slightly. Okay, so I'm another quick look on that map. So okay, we're going to start a very slow turn to the right until we're heading about 330 degrees would be good. Okay, so what we're going to do to begin with is just to explore what happens with airspeed and lift. So if we have a look from outside of the aeroplane, I can kind of draw some diagrams with the mouse or, you know, gesticulate with the mouse to explain things. So 315 would probably be good, wouldn't it? No, 330 would be better angle. So we're just turning around across the area we're going to practice. So, we're more or less at 330 degrees. Let's go and have a look outside. So we're flying along and I've already trimmed the aircraft down. And the reason for trimming it is we're running at 50% throttle at the moment. So we're just going along quite slowly and that's on purpose so I can show you something. I'm going to increase the throttle to 75%. I'm not touching the elevators. Look at the nose lifting. So as we increase in speed, when an aeroplane flies, I'm going to remove the throttle or pull the throttle back to 50% and you'll see it sinks back down again. When an aer aircraft flies in a straight line, when it's in equilibrium, you imagine the nose, all general aviation aeroplanes are nose heavy. So you've got the nose is trying to fall towards the floor. The wing is generating lift and pulling the nose towards the sky. Yeah. And the tail is making sure the aeroplane points in the same direction all the time. So the tail is really orienting the wing. That's what it's there for. 
So if you are going at a given airspeed, when you're in equilibrium, the amount of lift generated by the wing is the same as the, the weight, you know, or the force pulling the engine towards the ground. If you go faster, so I increase the throttle, more lift is generated by the wing and it wins. So you climb. If you slow down, so if I cut the throttle back, if I cut it back markedly, if we pull it back to idle, for example, look how steeply it falls. So the aircraft has slowed down, the, w the lift isn't being generated, and the aircraft falls towards the floor. But watch what happens. As we went downhill, the aircraft accelerated downhill, and it's levelling back out, because the increased airspeed has increased the lift. So it's reached equilibrium again. So we're going to jump back in, pull the engine back up to 50%, and we're going to have to start climbing. So we're going to go for 75% on the engine, and we'll start a turn back the opposite direction. So we're going to go to 135 degrees. We're going to do a standard rate turn to get there. So notice the turn, you bank the aircraft, so the, the forces are offset, so rather than the wing just lifting us, it's actually pulling us to one side. So I'm not using the rudder. So it, actually, because we're going so slowly, it's not really even showing on the turn coordinator. But if I was to use the rudder, you can see the turn coordinator starts moving, which means the aircraft is skidding through the air. So let's carry on our turn. So we're back at 2,000 feet. We're just coming around to a 135, which would be going back the other way across the circle that we flew across. So let's just go and have a look at that on the map to see that happening. So we're coming back the other way. And again, I'm still at 75% throttle. So I'm just cutting that back to 50 now. So there's 135 degrees on the compass. Okay, so let's do those illustrations of using the rudder to yaw the aircraft and watch the turn coordinator. So if I if I turn left on the rudder, if I go full rudder, watch what happens to the... Why did the aeroplane bank? If you think about it, the right wing went faster than the left wing because we twisted the aircraft left. So more, weight, more, more uh, lift was generated by the right wing than the left wing. But even more so than that, if we look at the aeroplane from outside, the wings have a, an amount of dihedral, so the, the tips are higher than the middle. So as you twist the wing into the air, the air gets underneath the wing and lifts it. Yeah? So that's what happened there. If we do it to the right, you'll see the same thing again. Okay, so I'm going to hold right rudder with no aileron to counter it. So right rudder, I'm just doing it gently, and it's rolling right, look. So the wing, the wind is getting underneath the surface of that wing. Let's go back the other way. So I'm just using rudder, no aileron, and it's rolling the plane. So let's use the ailerons to level it up. So you can yaw by using adverse aileron. So the opposite direction on the ailerons. So if I wanted to yaw, I'm holding left aileron with right rudder. And you can see the bubble, the aeroplane is crabbing along. You can see we're actually going. If you look, look at the landscape underneath, we're going that way. We're actually continuing to turn though. So I'll come off the rudder. The rudder actually got stuck then. I'm not sure if that was the simulator or the joystick went wrong. That was interesting. Okay, so we've lost some height while we were doing that, so we'll climb back up, 75% back up again. Let's have a look on the map, see where we are. So these are kind of just basic manoeuvres you might do to practice. So we're going to turn back round, another standard turn, we're going to climb back up to 2,000 feet. Go back for 315 degrees again, hopefully. So we've just gone through 2,000 feet, so we can, can drop the 
uh, reduce the throttle, you can re-trim the aircraft. We've gone slightly over 2,000 feet now, so you can see on the vertical speed what's going on there. So if we let the nose drop gently, you'll see the altitude drop off. Okay, so we're now flying back across the area that we were going to practice. You can see we're heading back across our circle. Okay, so I guess the next thing we could look at uh, is entering the pattern, or entering the circuit, I should say, the pattern. Pattern's really a military term. So we are going to do a 45 degree turn to the right. So we're going to turn to 45 or yeah, 45 degrees will be perfect actually. So I'm pulling in a slight amount of elevator to hold the nose. If I don't hold the elevator, the nose will drop because of the resolving of forces. If you think about it, the airplane's banked. The wing isn't generating lift straight up. So the nose drops. So you have to hold a small amount of elevator to maintain altitude and turn. Okay, so we've now just gone through 45 degrees, so we level back up. And we can trim the elevator for the speed we're at to neither climb or descend. Well, that's the idea anyway. You do not fly the aeroplane with the trim. You use the stick to get the aeroplane to the attitude you want, and then you use the trim progressively to make sure you can let go of the stick and nothing will happen, or re remove pressure on the yoke in terms of the real aircraft. If you have trimmed the aeroplane accurately, you can remove pressure on the yoke and nothing will happen to the aeroplane. So you see we are flying towards the entry point for the pattern at, sorry, sorry the circuit, I said it again, at Wickham. So what we're going to look to do is look to have Stoke and Church on our left and then turn to about 110 degrees. Yeah, so there's a, a village over here called Stoke and Church. So if we sit down in the cockpit, there's Stoke and Church. So when that is, we can see it's not going to be long. When that's at the end of our wing, coming from this direction. Again, this is all visual references. So we wait for Stoke and Church to be on the end of our wing. And then we turn right to 110 degrees. So we're still at 2,000 feet, remember. Okay, we're going to begin our turn. So let's sit up so we can see the instruments easily. So we're turning for 110 degrees. Now we want to make sure we're going to line up on a road that's down here that leads to the end of the hill. So if you look where we are on the map, yeah, we're just coming in now, so it's a bit, I'm doing all this a bit too quickly. There's a road down here that lines up on the end of this hill, so we're going to turn left now to 60 degrees. So this is all visual references all the way. So there's 60 degrees. There's the end, there's this hill here, and there's the end of it. So, if you are approaching um, the circuit, and you're not in the circuit yet, you typically come in and you fly over the airfield 500 feet higher than the circuit, and then you enter the circuit. So we would be too high to come into the circuit at this point. So we're going to climb back out to 2,000 feet. And we'll overfly the airfield. So the way we do this is we look down, we look out the window, and we will see a building down here, which marks our turning point. 
this is again this is all visual references it only works for this circuit I'm in trouble getting to the window to see this if you look right as well yeah we've come too far Look on the map, you'll see what's happened. I've come too far, so I'm just doubling back. Oh, that's a shame. So, we're going to do kind of a, an exaggerated version of this. So, we just the only real rule here is you have to stay away from Wickham. Yeah, you don't fly over the town. But when we enter the, we'll see this properly when we enter the circuit. This just shows how difficult it is to establish. Um, visual cues when you're at altitude. <coughs> so we go for 150 degrees. So again, we're staying away from the town. Yeah, there's the there's the airfield. You can see it directly in front of us. Yeah. So we're staying away from the town to overfly the airfield. We're coming down to the pattern height, so we, we are too low at the moment. So we're going to climb. Standard turn, and we should fly over the runway. You can see it down there. And then once we are over the top of the runway, you might wiggle your wings. I know it sounds crazy, but it's one of the things you might do to attract attention that you are entering the pattern. So you fly runway direction, which is about 245 degrees. Again, we're a little bit low. We'll climb back out to 2000. If we look overhead, See, there's the airfield. So we're going to go into the pattern there. So we're 2,000 feet, so we're going to descend into the pattern. So what we do here is we drop to 1,500 feet, which is 1,000 feet over the ground, remember. And what we're looking for is these two towns here. So we're just coming down to... 1500 feet. If you look on the map, you can see this happening. So, yeah, there is a, a first settlement here. If we go and skid over to the window, and then there's trees between them, and then there's another town. So, we are going to turn, do a standard turn here. So, we're coming down to 1500 feet onto this circuit. So we're now turning for 330 degrees. So we're at 1500 feet, which is a thousand feet above the ground. So we remove our vertical speed now. We hold 330. Got a little bit low, so we're just pulling the nose up gently and applying a bit more power to climb. So the next thing we need to look for is this road that will pass underneath us. When we see that road passing underneath, we will begin our right turn and we'll turn right to 60 degrees. So we're at 1500 feet. Okay, so we're going to begin our right turn. We're looking at the turn coordinator there, we're looking at the, the vertical speed to feed in the right amount of elevator. We're looking for 60 degrees on the compass. And this is where we'll hopefully do this a lot better than we did on our approach in. 
And again, this is where you practice things. So we're now flying 60 degrees. So there's the end of the hill, there's the house. So we've gone a little bit long, so we'll just turn for the, the building. Holding 1500 feet, just descending a little bit will stop that from happening. So remember, this is to fly at 1,000 feet above airfield elevation. So what we're looking for here, just in terms of visual references, is you see this building and we turn to just miss the edge of the industrial estate. So it just shows when we were 1,000 feet higher, or 500 feet higher, it became much more difficult to see those references. And we actually missed one. Okay, so here comes the house on the hill. There's a church there as well. So as soon as you can see it, you can begin your left turn. So standard rate turn, 250 degrees, which should take us out to the industrial estate. We start dropping now to 500 feet above the ground and we can extend the flaps one stage once we get to the um, safe flap speed so we're gone to 160 we're just going to come back to 150 degrees there we go so the flaps can come down now we're dropping gently to thousand feet and if you look sideways you'll see the airfield over here so coming down to the right distance then we begin our turn towards the airfield We're a little bit high looking at the Vasi lights. So we want them to be one white and one red. So we'll just descend by using the throttle to make that happen. We won't change the attitude of the aircraft. Increase the flap level. We're still high, but the aircraft is dropping. And we've got one white and one red, we're perfect. So increase the throttle to stop that descent from happening. So we'll just, we're visual with the runway now, obviously. Just rolling in. Lining up on the centre line, using the rudder and the ailerons to do that. And then cut the throttle. And we're down. Okay, so flaps up, apply wheel brakes, and we can turn off the runway and taxi in. So every flight you do, or that I do, I learn things new, and today the, the learning was the um, being above the above the circuit changes your references. And it just showed how easy it is if you're talking and not concentrating entirely on what's going on outside. You can very easily miss what's going on. So we're going far too fast here by the way. another thing I got wrong I didn't on approach I should have gone to a full rich mixture and I didn't and again that's the whole problem of talking and doing and that's why you practice things 
I should have gone to a fully rich mixture and the reason for doing that is in case you need to um, go around so you've got the fuel mixture ready to go full power Hey, I'm just going to park up over here. Parking brake on. And we starve the engine of fuel to cut it off, which makes sure there's no fuel left unburnt in the engine. And then we can turn the magnetos off. And we can turn all the lights off. We should have turned the landing lights off as well, actually, while we were taxiing. Again, busy talking. Um, turn the alternator off, turn the batteries off, and we are good to go. So hopefully you enjoyed that. There were mistakes in there, and I, I have a habit. I, I, I lose track while I'm talking quite often, but I always leave those things in because then you can highlight them, and it's common mistakes that you can easily make. So that you saw there, taxiing back, I didn't turn the landing light off. You're going to blind people. Um, on approach I didn't go to a fully rich mixture and I should have done in case there's an emergency in case you have to go for full power so otherwise it was it was quite a good session so obviously I need to practice and practice and practice but the, this is why you see people practicing circuits so they learn the reference points they learn the timings they learn the patterns and the procedures anyway I'm gonna leave it there and hopefully we'll see you again soon and we'll be looking at an either more practicing of circuits or uh, some further things like spins maybe. <laughs> Obviously sp spins sound scary but they're one of the first things you have to look at because it could happen and you have to be able to get out of it. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. See you again soon.